A warm welcome back to the Live Story Studio. I'm Maria Vias, and I'm hugely proud and excited to bring you the second episode featuring my interview with the one and only Trevor Sorby, MBE. If you missed the first part, don't worry, it's still online. And if you did see it, I'm sure you're dead keen to hear more about Trevor's incredible life. So without further ado, let's pick up where we left off. Enjoy. Hello and welcome back to the Life Story Studio where I'm chatting to the illustrious Trevor Sorby, MBE. Trevor, um, something I've always wanted to ask you, you left so soon in the late 70s mm. and I understand you had a brief adventure in Mexico, mm. is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that all about? Well, I think firstly you have to know one thing before that happened. Um, I, they asked me if I would go to the Milan uh, Vidal Sassoon Salon because it was not really happening and the, the, the geometric cuts were not working in Italy. Um, Do you mean the Italian people wouldn't accept them? Yeah, they wanted to look glamorous, it's the Italian way. I understand and it wasn't really working so they sent me out there. I said, look, I'll, I'll go out there. I said, but I'm going to have to give up my car, my girlfriend and, you know, my family um, for however long. I said, can I have 10 pound a week rise? And they said, no. Ooh. And I thought, okay, well, I still went. And I was there for about six months. And uh, one day I got a call from America, a guy called Fernando Romero, who was the creative ambassador for Vidal Sassoon in the whole of America. And uh, he said, Trev, he said, I've left the company. I went, what, you left the company, why? He said, um, I'm, I've got a new venture that I'm starting out in Mexico. I'm going into partnership with a guy called Noel Serra. And he says, I want to start up an art team. Would you be interested? And I thought about it and I said, yeah. And, you know, I thought I only wanted £10 a week more. Mm. And I just thought that was rather harsh, mm. to be honest. Mm. And I lost a little bit of mm. faith there. Not for the... Well, just for that alone, really. Well, you deserved it. and you. Well, I thought so. Bit perhaps a little cheated that you didn't... I felt that, you know. So um, off I went to America. Within 10 days, I was living in Mexico City. How was that? Um, it's one of these sort of things that you wish you weren't in it, but you're glad you came out of it right. kind of thing. Um, Mexico is a wild place. I mean, you're either rich or you're poor, and there's nothing in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't either. And I just felt this place wasn't for me. And I was living in a very, very down market part of the city called Zona Rossa, the pink zone. And it wasn't very um, safe. No. And how did the hair work go down in Mexico then? Well, I tell you something, the only thing that kept me alive down there really was uh, Noel Serra. It wasn't Fernando that um, kept me buzzed up. Noel Serra was a fabulous, he's godfather to my daughter actually, mm. that's how much we, well we got on okay. and um, um, he was so creative, I mean, this is a true... To pick up on Viv's point, was he a hairdresser, yes. not a hair cutter? He was French, but he could cut hair beautifully. And he would do 30 heads a day, yeah. but he had like 15 assistants doing all the blow dries. He never blow dry. He did the cut, then they'd come back to him and he'd fluff it up and boom. And, uh, but brilliant hairdresser. And this is absolutely true. Not many people know this. I, I was doing a show at Salon International and we were backstage and in those days you could smoke. And Noel came, used to fly over just to assist me and uh, not I needed assistance from him, he could do his own show. But um, he, he was smoking and he put this cigarette out in a metal ashtray and that metal ashtray was full of magnesium, 
Well, that flared up and it took all the skin off his hand. Now, this is just about before I was about to go on stage. And I, I thought, I can't go. You know, this guy needs hospital. And anyway, I had to go on. And he was rushed off to hospital. And he had plastic surgery, t skin taken off his leg and, you know, grafted onto his hand. Ooh. And in um, his recovery, he had to do um, physio. Therapy. And he went into the mountains and he learned to do basket weaving. To keep his hands dexterous. To get his hands working again. And he came the next year, he said, Trev, can I come over to London and help you on the show? And I went, yeah, of course. He said, I'm going to bring something with me. And I, I okay, you know. So he came, he stayed at my house and he showed me some strips of film of a hairstyle that he'd done and he'd made a hat out of hair. From the basket weaving? From the basket weaving. And uh, I said, that is unbelievable. Please, will you accept me to give you 10 minutes on my show as in your uh, slot for sure. you? And he came on stage, two young ladies dressed sort of masculine sort of dress and walking sticks and that. And uh, he did one thing I've never seen before and never seen it since. He, he just went up, sprayed, because they came out with hats made out of their, their own hair. And um, he just sprayed water on it and he undid it in front of them. And he didn't do a hairstyle, he undid, undid it. a hairstyle. Undid. And the play, I mean, he superseded my show by miles oh, with you. just one idea. And... Um, that's how clever he was, and wow. he was my inspiration in Mexico. Wow. So, actually, am I right in remembering? So that's very like an illusion that he did. You come out with these hair hats, and then you undo it, and mm. the illusion's gone. Yeah. You've used illusionists, haven't you, in your shows? Yeah. I, I, I've always loved um, unexpected ways of presenting a show, um, doing something that I've never seen before, um, and not just just not just the um, the hairstyle, but the what's around the hairstyle is just as important to me. The mood and how you add to the hair, if you like. Um, and I've used some very good people. I've always believed in using the right people for the right job. I, I, me as a hairdresser, that's my job. Mm. But to do a stage production, that's somebody else's um, sort mm. of but the idea expertise. But the idea is yours, and that goes No, back. not always, not always. I, I, will, I can accept a good idea if it's better than mine, and I'll go with the flow. But, um, you know, most of my ideas were used, but I, I always take... If I see something better, I'll use it. Well, it's, it's, as you said earlier on when we were chatting, you never stop thinking about how you can employ something that you see, mm -hmm. um, whether it's a plant or a yeah. fruit or a vegetable or something, whatever's in front of you, you'll find in your mind it turns you mm -hmm. into thinking about some application for yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, as I say, a hairstyle is a hairstyle. The way you present the hairstyle is equally as important to me, the dress, the makeup, yes. the yes. what's behind it. Yes. And so it's the whole sensual thing, yeah. all of it. It's a visual, it's theatre. Yes. Almost. Yeah, you know, it's entertainment as well. And I know it, it shouldn't get too pulled into dancing girls and all of that, but sometimes you have to present it in a way that makes it visually entertaining yes. as much as it is you know focused on the hair i remember seeing a show of yours where you had models that looked on stage as if they were sitting in midair oh yeah do you remember that one yeah yeah and yeah. i thought how the heck has he done that yeah how the heck has he done that and you know it was only about two years later uh, that i saw yeah. exactly that on brighton seafront yeah. yeah and i thought 
Whoa, yeah. he must have seen something yeah. somewhere. Where did you see yeah. that? In Covent Garden, there's a lot of street entertainers. And uh, I saw this crowd around this one person I couldn't see because of all the people. But he was sitting in midair. Mm. I thought, well, how the hell does that work? And people were looking underneath and looking for how it was done. And it's a very simple thing, you know, it's a steel rod basically and he, with a little chair on it. But he disguises it all. Disguised with their clothes. Y yeah. I, do you know what? I still don't know. No, I still <laughs> he don't did really it know. on the street. Yeah. But I love that. I yeah. thought that, you know, that's fascinating. And look at, the, look at the impact it has. So I went to these prop makers. And I said, look, this is the idea. Can you make you know, this up for a stage? And they, they did, and that's what you saw. And interestingly enough, when, when the show was over, half the crowd went backstage, and they weren't allowed to, to see, because we covered them all so that nobody could see what, backstage. What, what, yeah. And they're all looking at shitting cameras yeah. up to see <laughs> yeah. how it was done. Yeah. And still none the wise. And still not no. And I thought it was actually one of the best things I've done. I, I loved it. It was simple. Yeah. Simple. In actual fact, the idea was better than the hair. <laughs> <laughs> it really was. But it's the simplicity that works, isn't it? A bit well, like your wonderful Frenchman, a simple idea of just deconstructing a hair hat. You know what, uh, Maria, some of the best ideas the are dead simple. Ones. Uh, but and I've always always remember these words and I say it, I've said it many times on on stage Charlie Chaplin would say doing what I do is easy thinking of what I do is difficult that's right and that's right. that's that's it in a nutshell I've got one thing that's burning away in me what was the magnesium doing backstage at Salon Inter? You were allowed to smoke in those days. Right, so, but where's the magnesium come into? It was a, an illusion, uh, not an illusion, an effect on stage. Oh, I see. That was allowed. I see. Even by the fire regulations. I, uh, I understand it that. Was, Gosh. It was safe on yeah. stage, but it came backstage and somebody no. dumped it on Just her. ask Trevor in case it's yeah. some kind of weird magic ingredient. No, no, really no, it medicine. was accidental. It was no, well, it was somebody's fault, but you yeah. can't blame anyone. So you you've had, um, you had your brush with Italy, um, doing some work out there in Milan. Um, I think it will come as, a, well, that was in the Sassoon days, I think it'll come as a surprise to some people to know that you also spent a few months working at the... Italian company Tony and Guy, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Tell us about that. Well, um, when I came back from Mexico, um, I, I didn't know where to go. And I thought, Tony and Guy. I mean, they were, I saw them coming up, especially Anthony. And uh, I, I, got, I worked there, and Anthony was my assistant, actually. He used to hand up to me. And, uh, but he, I saw something in him that was special that he didn't obviously see in himself and he used to sketch things and I used to look at him and think mm, nice yeah, very nice mm. and I saw a talent there you, you know I can spot talent mm. like, that. like that you know it's it's not difficult for but, me anyway well you spotted the talent but did you spot the fact that given time the pair of you would end up between you winning British hairdresser of the year, yes. seven times between you. Um, Anthony is a man who you've long, long admired and mm. worked with. Shall we see what he thinks about you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please. Well, um, I first met Trevor Sorby when uh, it was my brother who knew him. And he, he then uh, came and worked for us at, uh, at Davis Street. Tony and Guy in Davis Street. I think I was about 16, 17. Then when Trevor came, it was exciting because we started to do Salon International at the time. I remember doing the show uh, at Salon where it was me and my brothers and, and Trevor was on stage with us. So it was, um, I knew him as a, as a, um, you know, the creative director with my brother. He stayed with us for about six months and then moved on. And then in the 80s, Trevor was really kind of, you know, doing some great things and, you know, with fantasy and doing all different things. I think at the time, it started, like, I started getting really interested. I think it was very much a, a, a strong rivalry in, in the sense of, I don't think I was rivalry for him, but for me, it was somebody that 
you know, I would see and wanted to, you know, be as good and, and to really push my push my uh, artistic creativity to to be as good as I could be. And I think in that time, you know, Trevor was uh, doing the scrunch. She was doing loads of different things that were really, you know, groundbreaking and very, really great for the industry and changing the industry. And uh, you know, for me, he was one of the, the, the main leaders in in uh, in that period in that time. And still, you know, for me, one of the best hairdressers ever, and a great mentor in the sense of, you know, I want to be as good as that and keep working and keep striving. And you know, and when he would do his shows, he was always so articulate and really good at, at, you know, really kind of coming up with great ideas and different things. And I think he's one of the ones that have really left a tremendous mark. You know, with you know, so many people that have worked with him, that are very, you know, famous hairdressers today that have really built great businesses and, and great kind of creative work that have come from his, you know, his salons. And I think that's one of the things that um, I think he's left behind because um, I'd started doing photography it was great to be able to to do things together there was a couple we did we did um, a shoot um, where there was Trevor and a few other hairdressers and we all worked together on on creating like this multi kind of image collection and then there was another time when we did um, a collection together and then did a show together that was early 2000 and that, that was really good fun, you know. It a, we did some good stuff. Um, I, I liked working a lot with him. He was a very talented guy. For me, I will always remember him as one of the ones that really inspired me to be as good as I could be. Because he always had such a tremendous level of wanting to achieve and be, you know, brilliant. And I think he's left an amazing imprint, you know, Trevor Sorby print with all the people that uh, are creating and doing stuff today. How does that make you feel, hearing yeah. Anthony say yeah. that you're one of the most gifted hairdressers he can mention? Well, it's his point of view. Um, but, no, I, I, what can I say? You know, it's, it's wonderful. He's, he's so talented. I mean, he's, he's one of us, you know. He's one of the boys. How do you feel about his work, Trevor? Oh, I mean, what I like about him, not only with his work, but how he's developed into photography. When he first started doing photographs, they were pretty groundbreaking, mm. um, in my opinion. Mm. Um, so he's developed into, and, and what I like about him, unlike me, he's actually quite a good businessman. Mm. Um, and I'm not at all. And uh, he, he's, he's got a He's more well-rounded than me, um, and his work is, well, <laughs> still to this day, you know, one of the main runners in the race. Um, Do you remember the collaboration when you worked on a shoot together? Yeah, 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 very well, yeah. You know, there's cer certain milestones in your career that you never forget, yeah. uh, and working with people that you admire is is one of the highlights and he's one of them definitely john frieda um i had total respect for john and his work um and felt privileged to be in his company and be employed by him i mean i saw when i worked at john because i left tony and guy and i went freelance for a little while just doing magazine work and then i um and then i went to john's and that's when Nicky Clark was there and he was the art director. And John, give you an idea, he had, a, he had a way of working and you had to follow his method, understandably. He'd wash the hair, have the hair washed, he'd, he'd sort of towel dry it almost until it was dry and then he'd cut it and then he'd finger dry it. And uh, I had to adopt a similar system. And one day I was, uh, I mean, I, don't get me wrong when I say this, but you, a lot of people will know what I mean. Um, his clientele was very sort of ladies at lunch mm -hmm. type of thing. Mm -hmm. Quite difficult type of clientele, to be honest. And I had this one lady, she had thick, long, red, porous hair. And um, she wanted it dried in the John Frieda way. And I said to this lady, because I was backed up by a couple of clients, and I said, do you mind if I speed this process up a little bit? And she went all right and I thought you bitch <laughs> and uh, I got a big handful of hair put it in my hand put the hair dryer into it 
held it tight for a few seconds, let it go, and boom, out came the scrunch. Mm. And I, you know, I thought, wow, if I had stood there for a month trying to get that, I, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have happened. And I tried it on different lengths, different textures of hair, even straight hair, and it worked every time. Mm -hmm. You could get curl in hair just by, it's a, basically, like, instead of a roller set, it was a hand mm -hmm. set, mm -hmm. uh, but in a more disheveled way. And that's how the scrunch, again. Again. An accident. An accident. That look, but, at, look at the su success of that. Yeah, Incredible. yeah. But the one thing I was going to say about John, he had these, every Saturday, these two twins would come in, identical, and the hair was identical. Long red hair there. Every week I was there for six months, and he never did the same hairstyle twice. Truly. He would plait it one day, he'd put it up the next time, he'd do this with it this time. He, his variety of hairdressing skills was, well, I, I haven't seen anyone work like that. It's interesting, isn't it? Because technically, you're all rivals, aren't you? I mean, yeah, you in a way, you're friendly for, rivals. But you're friendly rivals. Yeah. But I can't think of any other industry where rivals are so... Um, enamoured with each other and friendly with each other and so giving with each other. Yeah, you know why? Why? Respect. Respect? Yeah. I, I know thousands of hairdressers, but I have great respect for certain hairdressers that I know. You know, John, Anthony, Guy Kramer, um, to name a few, you know, um, the Millers, Charlie Miller and his team, um, Alan Edwards, I mean, they're, they've all got my greatest respect. They do it their way, mm. um, and I do it my way, mm. but you can always see their, mm. uh, their, their piece of the cake yeah, being their, cut their for signature. them. Yeah, signature, yeah. So that's probably then why the fellowship, because we're here today um, courtesy of the fellowship, mm -hmm. because they bring together yeah. and share yeah. And I, I've always thought that if you're so brilliant at something, share it, because everybody will have their take on it. Yeah. Um, would you agree with that, Trevor? Well, I, you know, I think that you've summed it up perfectly well about the fellowship, because it's, it's not trying to sell a magazine. It's not trying to make money or, or do these things. It's not political. It's hairdressing mm. first and foremost mm. and sharing and sharing and bringing the youth into it as well i mean i remember um <laughs> i mean i was asked once if i would be the president of it and i said no and Anne herman said why i said because i can't give speeches uh, i can't be I, I don't know how to wear a chain round when they can give a formal speech. And I said, on that basis alone, I'm out. No. <laughs> but it didn't stop them, did it? Giving you the most illustrious title in right. the fellowship. Yeah. And I should always remember you ringing me up, actually. I was on the Hairdresser's Journal at the time. Yeah. And you phoned me and said, Maria, I've just been given the highest accolade. Yeah. The fellowship have given me the patron d'honneur. Yeah. Um, oh. I, you, you were thrilled with that. What a you? moment. Well, there was only two other people that had got it. Vidal Sassoon and uh, Raymond. At the time, Weezy. that's right. And, and I'm, I'm little old me in the middle of those two greats. Mm. Yeah, oh, you know, there's highlights and there's highlights, yeah. but that was like yeah. right up there. Yeah. It's great me. that we've got the fellowship, isn't it? Mm? You know, it's great that we have the fellowship so that it's you know, neutral and the fraternity where you can all share and learn it's neutral and that's what i like about it mm. bring the youth up mm. still respect the old boys mm. and it's got a peace for everybody it, it's it's unique i don't know if it, it happens unique. in other countries i've never heard of it and i've never heard of it actually in any other kind of business to be honest no no, no. Um, interesting, though, because you mentioned one thing you admired about Anthony mm. is the fact that he is more rounded mm. and that, apart from being very creative, he's also quite gifted at business. Yeah. Um, you opened your salon, didn't you, in 79. Mm -hmm. um, how did you find that then? Because you're, you're now 
a businessman really yeah. with a salon. How, how did you find, how did you balance that? How did, uh, you, how did you get on with that? Well, I've never balanced it. I hate business. Hmm. It's bad for me. Hmm. I used to sit in a, a yeah, um, what's the word? Um, board meetings? Yeah, yeah, board meetings and, and way accounts meetings and yeah. that. And I, I, everyone's around and got computers out and, and I had a pad. And all I used to do was just draw hairstyles as they were talking about stuff. Yeah. And uh, I used to agree with it, but I didn't know what I was agreeing to. I'm, I, I don't like it. I don't want to be a businessman because I'm not good at it. And if I'm not good at it, I'll find somebody that is good at it. Mm. You know, marketing, I'm not good at it. I'll get a good marketing person. PR, I'm not good at it. I get a good PR. I, 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 I slice the cake up mm. to people that are good at what they do. But I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've also seen you as a man who's not financially money motivated. No. You're not, are you? No, I, if I get it, I spend it, I, you know, I mean, I've never woken up for a pound. Mm. I was going to say a pound note, but they don't exist anymore. Um, I've never woke up for a pound coin. No. Um, your, your reward is in the achievement. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I wake up to be as best as I can be at hairdressing. That's, that's what will make the money. Mm. And, of course, it must be difficult for you because you, you were so damn good throughout those 80s and 90s uh, when you were reaching your zenith um, not saying you're not there now but you know at that time I was there yeah. and you know on all of that media coverage TV appearances mm. worldwide shows standing ovations I handed you the British hairdresser of the year award four times you know unheard of mm. uh, the brand development the American business you had six grew to six salons I remember the education facility you had in Savile yeah, Row. Yeah. Um, you totally were the king of the castle, Trevor. Mm. But the pressure on that must have been huge. Yeah. How, did you, how did you manage to stay? You've already said that you're a fragile man mm. um, and that you have your depressions. How the heck did you manage to cope with all of that and all of the demands that people put upon you? One word, hairdressing. I just focused on my job. I, 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 my job was to take this company creatively to this level in my head. And that was my job, my focus. And all of that had to be taken care of by other people. And I didn't let it get into me. Mm. It, it, I had to get, it did affect me, but not like, I used to put a glass wall up. Mm. And I, it, it, it did get penetrated from time to time, but it didn't take me off that course. Your total focus. I was laser beamed into it, and that kept me straight and narrow, mm. and kept me sane sometimes. <laughs> you was, see, was hairdressing. The... I think any art form is a good. It's a great thing, but it's it's something. It's it's frustrating. Hairdressing and art and music and all the other um, forms of art. It, you have 10 goes, it's, you have time and time again, you try something you try, and half of them end up in the bin and there's one that get, gets you. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that people see. They don't know about what the ones that they didn't see, the disasters, the, the time it went into creating a disaster. And sometimes, you know, the simplest thing just was the, the magic one. But if you don't strive for all 10 of those, you won't get the one. Mm. And that one is what you aim for. So when you were doing all of that, uh, trying so many different things, mm. it was nothing professionally that made you buckle. It was the, it, nothing mentally made you buckle with hair it's your personal life that mm. makes you buckle. Oh yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's not the hair at all. It's your person. It's your yeah. personal life, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I didn't buckle under business. I buckled under personal. Yes. Yes. You know yes. problems. So, if you were to go back in time, Trevor, 
Is there any advice you'd give yourself now as a younger man? Watch out for this or look out for that? Oh, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll sum it up in an in, in a, a overall way. Never believe everything you read in a newspaper. Never believe anything you see on TV. And um, make your own assumptions. I have been... I've been exposed um, in the worst possible way that I could ever imagine. I was... Um, What's the word? They I think you're heading towards that absolutely hideous time when you were the victim of a kiss and tell. Yeah. Is that where you're going with yeah. this? Yeah. That, that was horrific, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to know the story first. I had a client, very friendly with her, and she knew I was separated from my wife for... It was 18 months I was separated. And this client of mine said, oh, I've got a friend that you might like to meet. To date? Yeah. And I says, nah. I says, no. Nah. She said, no, dear, she's lovely. She'll, you'll like her. I said, oh, all right, all right. So I managed to create a date. And uh, I was to meet her in the Hilton Hotel in Park Lane. And um, I'm standing there, and I don't know who I'm looking for. I'm standing there, and there's people walking around all over the place. And there's this one lady who had a sort of a um, very, um, let's say, Knightsbridge, Knightsbridge looking, you know, jacket, jeans, and, you know, Hermes handbag, and scarf, and that. And she looked at me, and I looked at her, and just sort of kept looking around. And this woman started walking towards me. And I thought, oh. I thought, well, I hope it's not her. Anyway, she walked past me. I thought, oh, thank God. Anyway, she, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I looked around, and it was her. And I, oh, you, I said, yeah, are you, yeah. Oh, nice to meet you. Would you like a drink? So I went downstairs to the cocktail bar, and there was this little kind of cubicle thing that you couldn't really see out except in front and we had to drink and the first set of words that came out of her do you eat healthily i went no oh. do, do you exercise much i went no and i thought well this ain't gonna go far this <laughs> right not up my street at all and it it, it was boring you know I, it was it was not gonna happen ever Anyway, I thought, um, I started drinking my wine a bit quick, so, and then she was sipping hers, you know. And I said, uh, will you like another one? And she only had a little bit out, and mine was dry. I said, well, I'm going to go and get another one. So I went to the bar and uh, ordered a drink. And this young blonde-haired girl came up and s stood beside me ordering her drink. And she said, um, are you Trevor Sorby? I went, yeah. She said, oh, she said, she had a Swedish girl. And she had this accent. She said, oh, I used to watch you on television, on Style Challenge. You're so funny and I'd really enjoyed you, blah, blah, blah. I said, oh, well, you know, thank you very much and that. She said, uh, she, would you like to have a drink with me? I said, I said, look, hang on. Can you give me a few minutes? Um, just got to say goodbye to somebody and I'll be back down. So I <laughs> went back to my date. And I says, and she was like, finish her drink. She said, and she said, should we go and have some tea? I said, you know what? I said, I just ate before I came. I said, I, I, I skipped the meal. I said, we'll do that some other time. I said, um, anyway, I, I'm, I've got to go anyway. So I said, well, I'll see you into a taxi and off she went. I mean, I, I didn't want to hurt her feelings, but I think I did, not intentionally. And she went off. So I raced back downstairs, and I said, wait, you. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> we had a drink and that, and, I, and then I said to her, can, um, do, 
can I see you again? And she said, yeah. So I said, all right, I'll, say, I'll cook you dinner. So she said, oh, that'd be nice. So it was a Saturday night and I picked her up and uh, brought her back to my flat. And uh, I cooked her a very nice dinner. And it was, we got on very well, laughing and joking and that. And uh, one thing led to another, okay? And I um, had a great night. And uh, off she went. And, uh, and that was it, really. And um, then what happened? Oh, yeah. I was, um, I was doing a TV thing up north, and uh, I had a phone call. I was just about to get on the train, and it was a journalist. And he said, uh, do you know this girl? I forget her name even. Um, so I said, uh, and I did know who he was talking about. I said, no. He says, well, we think you do. I said, well, what makes you think that? He says, because she's got a telephone number for you, and uh, there's... Um, piece of headed note on a piece of headed note paper uh, all right so anyway I got on the train and I was start shaking and I thought anyway I went to this guy and I said look I think somebody's got something on me and uh, can you g get rid of him and he couldn't and um, next thing I know is um, I get a, a letter from her saying uh, it was a text, actually. She said, um, my, my parents have cut me off financially and, um, you know, I, I, I need some money. Would you be able to, you oh, know, help me really. financially? And I thought, no. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've only met her once, twice. Um, and that, that was it. I, just, I had no more communication. Next thing I know, about a week later, two weeks later, now I have a ritual. I, I love Grand Prix, and um, every Sunday there was a Grand Prix on. I would go to Tesco's, get a roast dinner, put it in the oven, and um, munch it while I'm watching Grand Prix. And that, that's what I did. And um, I got a telephone call. It was my uh, wife at the time, and she said, have you read the newspaper? And I said, what? No. She said, go and get it. So I went, all right. So I went and got it, News of the World. And I brought it back and opened it up, center pages, TV crimper cheats on wife. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. And I read it. And I thought, uh, well, I went into a spin. I went into a complete, I had a panic attack. I couldn't stop shaking. My body was quivering all over. I thought, I, I don't want to be here. I just don't want to be on this earth right now. And I, I, I went straight to the cabinet and I, I got a bottle of wine and I just dumped it down me. And uh, I was getting all woozy and stuff, and I got another one, I just downed that. And I thought, this is, I'm going to wake up soon. This is not happening. Mm -hmm. And next thing I know, cars are pulling up, my business partner, my wife, my daughter, my PR, all pulled up, and all clamoring in their flat. And I was just like all over the place. And the next thing I know, I'm being dragged out in a car. And I was, next thing I know, I'm in a hospital. And I'm in a little room. And I thought, what the hell is happening to me? You know, this is, mm. I can't take this. Mm. This is not right. And um, I thought, I've got to get out of here. I've gone home. So I had to, somebody packed a bag for me. I just packed it up and I went to the lift to get out and uh, there were three guys standing at the, at the lift. I said, excuse me, guys. And they said, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going home. And they said, no, you're not. I said, bloody well I am, mate. I said, it's not a prison. He says, for you, it is. You're sectioned. I went, what? And they kept me in that hospital 
And um, I was in there a month. I was drugged up to the eyeballs. And it was... Awful. It was the worst experience yeah. I've ever had yeah. in my in your whole life. life. Yeah. I wanted not to be here. Yeah. And for a man who's fragile, for a man who has got his demons in depression, Trevor, that must have oh. pretty much polished you off. And don't forget it. No. Can you remember much about that no. month? Or well, only that you were drugged out of your eyes. Glimpses of it, glimpses of it. I was in there with people, and I'm talking about like lawyers and all kinds of people, you know, people that slept on the streets, all drug addicts and, you know, winos and mm. just... A f but they were nice people in there, actually. Yeah, of course. Of course. They were all right. I got on well with them. Yeah. But, um, but how did you get out of this? How did you ever get any balance back? Well, you got me out. Well, yes, I did. Uh, and that was a big shock. And yeah. it, it was... It was so unexpected. Um, you might not even remember calling me. Um, it, was, it was the days, you know, when I was no longer on the journal, um, but I was working at Procter & Gamble, and you called me on a Saturday afternoon. Mm. Are you all right? Do you want a glass of water? No. Yeah. Are you all right? Mm. And you called me on a Saturday afternoon and said, Maria, you've got to help me. You've got to get me out of here. And I said, Trevor, where are you? And you said, I don't know where I am. I'm in, I'm in a place that's... I remember you saying, I'm in a place with locked doors. And I thought, I don't like the sound of this. And I said, you know, I tried to sort of calm you down as best I could. And I said, I'll be there, I'll be there. I didn't know if I could get there because I didn't know where you were, but mm. I just wanted you to have some sort of comfort blanket. And through good old journalistic skills came to the fore. And by phoning around and getting hold of as many people as I could, your ex-wife included, um, located where you were and what you were doing. And bless your heart, you were in a mess, Trev, in a real mess. I've never seen anything quite so upsetting. Um, you all right? Do you want to come and give your husband a cuddle? You are allowed. You do live together. Join the fellowship today and be connected to the very best of the hairdressing industry. Together we can provide unique, educational, inspirational and creative opportunity, enabling you and your business to thrive. Joining today gives you unique fellowship projects across the full year. Access to personal backstage pass to the knowledge. Enter the fellowship awards, the best place to be recognised. And promote yourself and your business in our online directory. Join today and be part of the Fellowship for British Hairdressing. The Fellowship is all about education and that is the next step. Education online can be very, very helpful. Young people coming into our industry now, they're hungry to want to learn more. The knowledge is an amazing platform and it's something that our industry is really missing at the moment. Very often you can kind of days that are amazing where you think it's all come together really well and then other days where you think actually God we've got so much work to do. But it's always really rewarding when you sort of see it brought to life in the end. It's all about making things more accessible, isn't it? If you can reach more people and you can play a part in that evolution and the industry moving forward, then that's a, that's a great thing. Everything is starting to move online and I just think it's a medium that's going to inspire our up-and-coming hairdressers to help us 
deliver the fellow shoots message of quality and just keeping British hairdressing at the top spot. What therapy? Thank you. What therapy? You got a tissue, darling? <sighs> Damn it. You all right? Yeah. See, I knew this would happen. Yeah, I was hoping it wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. But it comes back, it yeah. floods back, I tell you. It's... But do you know what was worried me the most is what people would think of me. I just thought my staff would go, Phew. and I thought my clients wouldn't come in. I thought I've just ruined my life. Yeah. I, on one night, I've on just ruined my night. bloody life. And someone absolutely shafting you. Yeah. Absolutely shafting you. And yeah. you, I think you, help, you also held, another thing that just occurred to me, you held the Queen's warrant at the time, didn't you? Um, not quite. <laughs> you, did, you did have it, didn't you? No, no, no not quite. Um, <clears throat> um, when I got the MBE at the palace, um, my name was called out and I had top hat and tails and all that. And I went up to her, Your Majesty, and she said... <sighs> Hang on. Take your she time, said, Trevor. Okay. Take your time. We don't have to resume. Just take your time. No, no, I can, I can do this. I can do it. And she said, um, I, I understand you do some rather strange hairstyles. Oh, <laughs> that's nice. What? <laughs> I said, well, no, Your Majesty, I try and create some new ideas with hair. Uh, she, oh. she said, I've seen you on television. You, you're very good at what you do. I said, oh, so thank you very much. Thank you. And that, that was it. Now... Um, she said, we must have a chat one day soon. I went, all right. <laughs> I thought, I'm busy, but you know, I'll... I'll yes. um. Anyway, she, she has a way of getting rid of you. She shakes your hand, but she just gives you a nudge. Just oh, a she little. push you out. In other words, bugger off, oh, you've had your uh, ten That's minutes. it, you're done. You know, yeah, yeah, off you go. And Are you told about that? No. You just feel it. Oh, you know it. <laughs> you don't question it. You're just like, oh, don't think so. <laughs> so off I went. And, um, ah, oh, wonderful day. Wonderful, wonderful. Never forget it. Um, see, these are the highlights. It, it brings it right for me. Mm. You know, all right, I hit that, but boy, I get that. And then reward. you get the MBE. Imagine that. Yeah, I get that as a reward for yeah. something, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, and it brings it all right for me. I yeah. can deal with, well, I can't really deal with that, but it gives me um, a reason to go on. Yes, yes. A reason to go on. Absolutely right. And, of course, you did so many celebrities as well, didn't you, through that time? Yeah. I should always remember being in your salon when you were doing a trial run for the wedding uh, hair of Sting's wife, Trudy Styler. And we were downstairs in Covent Garden and you were doing the, uh, the trial for her uh -huh. wedding she, and she'd got this long veil and everything. Uh -huh. and I remember you dressing her hair so beautifully and then she went and plonked this bloody great big veil on top of it. Yeah, like, thanks. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. Nice one, yeah. Um, any funny stories yourself, Trevor, from celebrities you've done? I hear you had a close call once with Helen Mirren. Oh, yep. Um, yeah, right. Um, Helen came to me. She was doing this crime suspect a series uh, where she plays a policewoman and they wanted me to cut her hair. And I obviously couldn't be anything trendy or anything. So I gave her this sort of page boy, little page boy haircut. And it was fitting for her part. And I did that right the way through the series. Anyway, she came to me after Crime Suspect finished and she was in another film, which I can't even remember the name, but she wanted her hair cut in a different way. And I, I half, halfway, oh no, yeah, so I, I did that haircut on her and she was pleased with that. Anyway, 
but a year or two later, she, um, they came back and said, oh, we're doing, a, I think, a two-part serial on Crime Suspect again. So they said, Trev, would you give her the same haircut? And I went, yeah, yeah, she said, no problem. So she came in and I picked it up here. And normally I would start sort of there or at the back, but I started on the top and I started cutting. And I thought, shit. I'm giving her the wrong haircut. This is the one for the <laughs> film. <laughs> oh, this isn't the prime suspect. <laughs> oh, <the> oh no. <laughs> so I didn't let on. I said, you know what, Helen? I said, a few years have passed since the actual um, programme was on. I said, I think we have to update it a little bit. So I still had enough length to give her the sort of rough outline of Page Boy, but it was layered with all a, inside. With a roughed up interior. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I said, so you see, it's more up to date. And it's right that you've moved on, you know, and so is the programme. Oh, yes, Trevor. So she, yeah, yeah, yes, I think you're dead how right. Clever you know. of you. How clever of you. To yeah. Very creative <laughs> of you. Creative of you. <laughs> yeah, so I got all the praise, but um, I got out there and went, whoa. I, I got away with that one. You got away with it? Yeah. Well, she was lovely. And you know, bless her heart, I, I was doing a charity event one day in the salon and she walked in out of the blue, I didn't even know, and she came in and she dropped £200 check on. She said, there's that for your charity. Brilliant. Uh, it's a lovely, oh, lovely lady. Lovely. lovely. Do you miss, because you've sold the business now, haven't you? Yeah. Yes. Do you, I know that you've got a creative ambassadorial role. Yeah. Um, and of course, your business has grown even bigger, hasn't it? Because you've mm -hmm. got an overseas operation, yeah. and the six salons here. Mm -hmm. um, do you do you miss the, any of the going into the salon, or how does that work for you? Do you still ever go in and see oh, people? Oh yeah, you do. Yeah, I mean, when I was well, and um, I, yeah, I, I used I used to go in all the salons. You see, to me, I, you know, I stopped cutting hair a couple of years ago. Really, clients that is. Um, but the thing that draws me is my staff. Mm -hmm. I love my staff. I mean, I've got Nathan, 27 years, Tiziana, 25 years, Joe, uh, 20 odd years. I mean, I, I keep my staff mm -hmm. and I love it. Yes, I'm the boss, they're the employee, but we're mates and I don't, I, I do mix business with pleasure with them because they're friends. Mm. But you know, there is a line, I'll always hold them up if they're not doing the right things. Mm. Um, and that's what I really miss. And I'm still in touch, even though I haven't been near anyone no. outside of my house for the last nine months. Of course. Um, I, I'm on contact with them. I'm you, phoning the, the phone managers. Along, yeah. How's everything yeah. going? You know, I'm yeah, yeah I'm involved, yeah. and I, I will always want to be involved. Yeah. And it must be reassuring for you, Trevor, to know that the business side of things is be, you've, you're, you're very um, praiseworthy t with me about the gentleman who's bought the business. Ah, he's he's doing you he's doing you a good job, isn't he? You know, I, I've always had a bit of a problem with businessmen because I've had some bad situations especially in the american side and um the man that took up was well, not a man it's a company but the man at the head of the company is a man called imad and uh, they're from um um saudi where is it carol we dubai dubai yeah uh, we go there on holiday sometimes and uh He's from Dubai and he came along at the right time and he wanted to buy a business. And uh, he wanted a name, uh, he wanted a, a, a company with a history, um, company that knew the public side of life, not just the hairdressing side. And um, he basically bought the business. Um, and I'll tell you why I sold. And I think it's important that I say it because most people think you sell a business to make a load of money. Well, there is that aspect, of course. And it, that aspect was in my mind at the time. I was, what, 69, going on 70. I had 
my first wife got um, my house, my second wife got my pension, and my third wife got me. Lovely. And um, basically, the company was worth quite a lot of money, and, um, but it was on paper. And you can't go into a shop with a piece of paper and ask for a bag of sugar. Right? It doesn't work. You need cash. I didn't have any cash. I, I was, I, you know, I was pretty, not broke, but I wasn't what people think no, I was, not, rich. Not, not and, the public perception. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember um, uh, one article said I was worth five million. Yeah. I thought, yeah, who are they talking about? Because yeah. I can't yeah. see I've him. seen you referred to as multimillionaire. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it, yeah. on paper yeah. is one thing, but, but I, it wasn't is another. in my pocket. So I honestly felt that I had to have a bit of security yeah. financially. Yes. And he came along and the price was right. Um, and I got the financial security. Yes. And on one hand, I was punching the sky. I thought, oh, thank God, I don't have to worry about the rent or this or the mortgage or whatever it was. Because that what used to worry me, you know, the money side of things. Not that I, that was my first No, but it's thing, a worry for everybody. Yeah, exactly. You know, you have to worry about your yeah. living. Yeah. Um, and, um, but the funny thing was, three months later, I went, Boom. Did you? I went right down. Just go back a bit. When you actually sold the business, yeah. how hard was it for you to sign the documents? Well, it wasn't hard because... Emotionally, I mean, did you think, oh... My no, God. that happened three months later. Right, so it was after. I signed the paper and I thought, yes, yes, financial security. And then three months later, I thought, Hang on a sec, I've just sold my baby. Mm. That's my baby. Mm. You know, it was like my dog, it was like my daughter. It, it was my business, it was my baby. Mm. I, I grew up that from nothing to a multi-million pound company. Along with all my aids and help and everything, mm -hmm. my team. Uh, but I was at the, the name, if you like. Mm. and. Um, I hit the I hit ground zero again. Mm. I, it put me into a very very, very deep dark. depression, and unfortunately, I had to mask it and try to soften it. This depression. So what did I do? Well, I hit the bottle. I hit the bottle. Big time. Yeah. And Just the bottle. Oh, no, I was doing two, three bottles of wine a day. But no other narcotics? No, no, no. no. It was all, always all, all drink. alcohol. And um, I, never, I never drank at work. I kept that right out of that side of it. But when I got home, I used to hit it and hard. And it started to affect things, my wife could see what was happening to me. And um, I couldn't go to bed at night without getting tanked. Because that would knock me yeah. out. Because yeah. that would blur it. It would yeah, yeah. blur it. And um, I, um, I, I, was, I, was, I was addicted. I, I became an alcoholic. Did you? Yeah. I know it. How did you get out of that? My wife, oh. my dog, a realization that I was going down this path and I was going to lose everything. And that thought of losing everything was greater than stopping. So you, you actually disciplined yourself to yeah. stop, Trev. You didn't yeah. have any... I haven't had a drink in nine months. Good for you. Good for I'm, you. I'm going to tell a lie. I had a, a relapse. I bought a little one of these little bottles of wine one night, and uh, I drank it. And where I, was Carol? 
were not around. No, clearly. <laughs> and uh, I drank it in, in bed and I hid the empty bottle under the pillow and I woke up and I'd forgotten it was there. <laughs> and Carol came up and made, she doesn't, I make my own bed, but she, this morning, bloody hell, of all mornings, <laughs> she made my bed. It's called a woman's <laughs> intuition, Trevor. She, <laughs> she said, what's this? I went, oh, fuck, for God's <laughs> sake. <laughs> Inspector Clouseau's on the case again. And uh, I said, look, I, yeah, I did it. You know, what can I say? I can't help, you know, I can't mask that one over. And that was, that was it. That was the only time I touched it mm. in between. Mm. And you know what, Maria, they say when, you know, you drink a lot, you wake up with a fuzzy head and you're not clear. I used to always think I was clear. I never had a hangover, but I always thought I was clear. Mm. But the thing was, I used to duck out of things, events or meetings. I'd say, mm. oh no, sorry, I can't make it. I've got another arrangement. Mm. I, I used to duck out and it was only to go home and get I'm hammered hoping. again. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when you're in this business and everyone will relate to this when they go to these big events and L'Oreal Colour Trophy and all of that, yep, the awards, there's everything. wine yeah. just flowing like water. Yep. Yep. And, but I never, ever got drunk because I was sitting on tables where the managing director of L'Oreal was present, you know, and I had to stay. But as soon as I left, boof, mm. hit it. But to... Um... And I... Go ahead. My wife is the most important thing to me. She's, she's a disciplined lady. She exercises. She she's eats Proper nice. properly. Mm. You know, a lettuce sandwich and all that stuff. And um, I, she keeps me on track. Mm. And she tells me off. And she's the only one that will tell me off. And I don't like it most of the time, but she's, I know she's right. Yes. And so I stick to that. So it's Carol's therapy, really, then, that's yeah. prevented you from remaining. In, well, they say, don't they, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. But she's kept you away from alcohol. Yeah. You've not had to do any of those um, Alcoholics Anonymous meetings no. or anything like that. She's done it all for you. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. Yeah. I don't want to lose her. No. I can't. No, absolutely not. I, you know, I might as well... <laughs> yeah. Put a yeah. gun to my head. Yeah. If yeah. I lost her. And you know, the other thing was a few years ago, I read an article in a Sunday magazine, and it, this guy was writing. He said, um, People that suffer from anxiety or depression, he said, The best thing is a dog. And I thought, What? A dog? That's not a medicine. Well, it bloody well is. Well, as we've and seen today. He's good for me. He gives me some, you know, he gives me love. You mm. saw that right there. Mm. He knows when I'm in trouble. Yes. He knows, he senses yeah. me. Unconditional love yeah. as well. Yeah, and I need that. Yeah. And I, I've got a responsibility. Yeah. I'm not going to do something that will affect that. Yeah. I can't. But it's a... a stronger than... A it, it's a responsibility which is a very different one to the one that you had when you were running that great big... Yeah. Behemoth called Trevor Sorby yeah. Limited. You know, it, it's a very different responsibility, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's an unconditional one. He this has is, no expectation of you. This is right in there. Yeah. It's deep. Yeah. And I can't do without it. No. Whereas, you know, it's strange, isn't it? Because unwittingly, you're, as a man, you unwittingly drove Anthony Muscolo to be better. Although you're so harsh on yourself, mm. you unwittingly drove him to, you heard him say it, you know, I wanted to be as good as Trevor. Mm -hmm. um, and all of these inspirational hairdressers you've had in your team are, are incredible, Trevor. When we look at the roll call of people who come under the Trevor Sorby mantle, um, shall we start by hearing what some of them have got to say about you as a man? <laughs> um, shall we start with two Oh, I'm quite frightened of ladies, two very strong ladies who both used to work for you for a period of time. And by the way, who both claimed British Hairdresser of the Year trophy. Shall we see what they've got to say? <laughs> yeah, let's go. 
Well, I had a very interference joining Trevor Sorby because the first time I came for a job interview with Trevor, he actually turned me away <laughs> because in his his words, I didn't speak any English, and he was right, I didn't speak English. However, I decided I wasn't going to take no for an answer, and I went back six months later after learning a few English words and say, hey, I'm back again, I'm coming to work for you, whether you like it or not. And I think he was so gobsmacked at the time that he took me on. I think Trevor's one of them people that gives everybody an opportunity. It's a bit sink or swim with Trevor. Um, you can get the job, but whether you can keep the job and go on to succeed in that position is probably two very different things. Um, like I said, I learned really quickly that you had to really have a great work ethic to work for him. Trevor inspired me in so many different ways. He has this really unique way of thinking um, and something I've probably took from it is it's not always the end result but it's more the thought process that goes into the end result. And I think the biggest thing is he inspired me never to be afraid to fail. And I think that's something that, you know, what I call the, the, sor the sorbies of us that have left. Um, we always try and do something that is unique and that is different. Um, and that really honors what he taught us. I was trained according to the French system in the Netherlands, which is more about styling and hairdressing. And what Trevor did for me, he really taught me, you know, how to cut hair. And really he trained my eye. He trained me to look at things from a different kind of angle, from a different way. And, you know, having been his assistant for a little bit and having worked with him for over 10 years, he also taught me how to be on stage. And it was the most amazing education one could ever wish for. Do you know, I worked alongside Trevor for 10 years, solidly assisting him on stage, um, which was an incredible experience because I learned so much from watching. The one thing though is Trevor has really bad stage fright um, and he needs that space before he goes on stage to, to get into the zone of what he's doing. And I think the stage fright that Trevor has is what actually makes him connect to people. He's got this ability of talking to the person right at the back of the auditorium. I always say the person that's bought the cheapest ticket, he has an ability to talk to. And I don't think there's many artists that have that ability. So I actually think Trevor's stage fright was a positive thing because I think it made him the unique presenter that he was on stage. I mean, Trevor's done shows under insane circumstances. I remember him doing a show and he had an appendix attack and he just kept going. Uh, he did a show when a complete light thing fell down and he just kept going. Um, that's another thing I learned from Trevor. When everything just goes to pot, just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> it will always work out. The goal is not to live forever, but to create something that will. And I think that's a great sum up for Trevor's legacy because he's passed down what he knew to so many people that have then passed it down to their people that will then pass it down to their people. So Trevor will always be involved in this industry. And I think it's the most amazing legacy that he's done. Wow, that's, uh, that's some, some great words, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's funny hearing that about yourself because you don't see yourself like that. You, you don't know what you're giving out. I just give out what I give out. I mean, I don't plan anything. It's just is who I am. And but, it, but it's clear from what the, both those terrifically talented women yeah. said that you nurtured, without a doubt, you nurtured their creativity, the same as Vivian McKinder. They've all said similar things, haven't they? You see... My philosophy is to grow people, not put people down. Mm. And I, I, don't, I hope I don't ruffle feathers here, but in a lot of cases, the name above the door will always be the man or the woman in charge. And mm. you, you can't get past that because you can't. Um, well, I think you can. Mm. And I, I, I think I'm the only there to be um, uh, top topped again and and there's there's one 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 man that has topped me ten times over um, 
and he, he's, he's not a hairdresser, he's, he's more than that, he's an artist, he's a genius, he's everything I can think of that supersedes greatness, and that is uh, Angelo Seminara. That's your boy, Angelo Seminara. That's my boy. That's your boy, isn't it? I'd put my life on yeah. the line for him to, to come out with the next amazing, gobsmacking, idea yes which he does yeah um just before we hear what angelo's got to say may surprise you but we have got him <laughs> um sally said that which is interesting sally said you have a unique way of thinking when it comes to hair can you can you expand on that trevor what does she mean by that a unique way of thinking yeah well from what you've said, the only thing I can think of that has always been one way I look at hair is opposites work. Up, down, hot, cold, in, out, red, white, you know, opposites work in extreme um, differences, but they both work. And I've always tried to look at something and turn it on its head. And the best example I can give was um, the Wolfman cut that I did. And it, that was a, new, a typical example of turning everything upside down. I thought, right, hang on a sec. What's the opposite of... Um, the opposite of, of good, good colour or...? Well, I mean, let's, let, when I was thinking this, it was all still straight lines mm. and geometric type haircuts. I thought... Hair's coming down. What's the opposite of hair coming down? Hair going up. Okay. Now, what's the opposite of a good haircut? Well, you cut with the scissors. No. Cut with a razor. Instead of getting a blunt end, get a thin end to the hair. Right. So we cut with a razor. We make the hair stand up. What's the opposite of a good colour? A bad colour. Let's do a bad colour. Now, to most women, it many years ago, a bad colour was a regrowth. Let's do a regrowth. Let's just colour the ends of, of the hair and leave the, 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 the roots dark. So bad colour, different way of cutting, making the hair stand up and bang, you've got something brand new. And that's, you take, for example, a bob that comes down. Well, reverse that, you've got a page boy. Mm. You know, it's, mm. it's just turning it upside That's down. a different way of thinking. Yeah. Well, of course, one man who has got an extraordinary different way of thinking um, with his creativity, as we've just mentioned, is Angelo. Mm. Um, and I know that you two are like that. Mm. Um, obviously, we couldn't do this programme without him. But before we see him, we're going to take a bit of a break. I'll tell a little story first, if I may. Of course you may. Um, Angelo is very close where he was my best man at my wedding um, he was with me 15 years and um, was it one year or two years ago we were in Italy two two, two years ago and I said you know Angela I'd like to meet your mum and dad and he said, oh, they'd love to meet you because he'd spoken about me. And I went and met him. Now, his dad was very frail, very ill. He couldn't speak. Um, and we were sitting in this garden and we had this lamb dish. And um, I met him and he couldn't talk to me. But I could talk to him and he understood what I was saying. It was translated because he didn't speak English. And he was a truck driver. And... I felt he got me, I felt a connection, even though the, the language was immaterial, we felt each other. And I helped him into his bed that night and covered him up. And I was so privileged to meet his father. Mm. I felt that was so, that was important to me. Mm. And then I said, I want to meet the guy that taught you hairdressing, Angelo. And he drove me to this barber shop in um, the little town that he grew up in. And I met his boss. 
and um, and that meant a lot to me. Yeah. And I you know, bet. it was em very emotional. I bet. And um, Angelo said to said to me, and he said it out loud. He says, "Trevor is my father in England." Yes. And when his father passed away, I wrote him a card and I signed it off by saying, you're my son. Mm -hmm. Very, very emotional, Trevor. Oh, he means yeah, the world to yeah. me, yeah, yeah, the real yeah. world. And isn't it interesting too that I know that Angelo comes from a very humble origin. Yeah. Um, not a, not, your, your origin is humble, a, mm. t a tenement apartment outside Paisley. Uh, I know that Angelo is from a very small, mm. rural, rustic little village in mm -hmm. Calabria, isn't he? That's right. You know, so it's interesting that two such gifted men come from such very humble beginnings. So I think that's a good place for us to finish tonight's episode. Trevor and I are going to continue our chat. Follow the Fellowship social media to find out when you can catch the third and final episode. But for now, good night and thank you for watching. Coming up next, what is it really like to be the protégé of Trevor Sorby? He will always tell you, you know, if you do something bad, especially on an exam or something, he will be very, not rigid, but he's just honest. He's not going to bullshit you, basically.